For centuries, Grimsby and Hull were home to Britain's largest distant water fishing fleet. Night after night, fully manned trawlers set out for Iceland. In 1840, Hull and Grimsby perhaps had a dozen very small fishing vessels between them. By 1870, you could argue that they were the leading fishing ports in the world. During the 1880s, Hull and Grimsby adopted steam and began building purpose-built steam vessels. Um, and after 1890, 1891 to be probably precise, um, these fishing vessels started, the trawlers started to visit Iceland. The only thing we could ever see to improve our parents' life, our life, was to go to sea, to be a fisherman. It was an ambition, I think because we watched our fathers, we watched the neighbours, we watched everyone. And the only money what was in all at that time was the fishermen's money. They were the people who had just that extra bit of money. When a fisherman come home, he was the smartest man in the world. He had his suit and his... He, he, he felt a million dollars. Apart from the money, he, he felt a million dollars. They designed their own suits, their own shoes, and had them made in shops. They, they, they created square-toed shoes so they could stand nearer the bar. Sometimes you settled in debt. When I first started fishing, and you used to look at your hands and think, good God, they'll never heal up. And then within 36 hours, you was back to sea again. Well, the responsibility to the skipper was huge, really. Uh, he was given uh, a ship, 20 men, go and make it pay. There was always somebody there in, waiting for your job. And so, therefore, you, you used to put your men through hell and earth, uh, you know. I don't know how... I couldn't do it now. I couldn't put men through what I used to have to put men through. I often wake up at night uh, with bad dreams. Uh, yeah, and I do, seriously. Um, of the weather that we use for fishing. And the, I say, thank God I, I never lost a man, and I never maimed a man. But I was very, very fortunate. Until 1952, international agreements allowed British trawlers within three miles of the Icelandic coast. I don't know if it's three miles, and it's helst for the other. It's three miles, it's about 6 kilometers. And so was this like with the British and the Icelandic stewardship, and it's like this was a kind of an athlete. When there was no fish on the outside, I had to go straying inside. You know, it wasn't out of badness, it was uh, more for what we call a crack. You know, if you thought there was a bit more fish inside, well, you go for it. Just have a little game of cat and mouse with the Icelandic Coast Guard. They used to love me, I used to love them. On the 15th of May 1952, Iceland extended the limit to four miles. Flags were lowered to half-mast in all British fishing ports. The Grimsby Evening Telegraph dubbed it Black Thursday, the darkest day the British fishing industry had ever known. Extending from three miles to four miles was not a problem, not from the fisherman's point of view. It was the point to point that they introduced, which didn't just cut out hundreds of square miles of fishing ground inside places like Breedy Bay and Faxhoy and whatever, but um, it really just denied you any shelter. You couldn't get into those places to shelter from the weather. So when the weather really got atrocious, you had to stop fishing or force the elements and force your men to work through extreme you know, conditions. And that's unfortunately what happened. The man that is in the South Cove had a little bit of weather in West Verona, and he saw him had a little tour, and he saw him out of here, and he saw him out of here. And he saw him out of here, and he saw him out of here. 
og hann játaði strax og hann sagði að það var bara spurt hafsumanni að hann hafði verið á Ísafirði og spurt hafsumanni að hvað að há sekt var fyrir landsvísbót og þegar hann fekk að vita hvað það var að há sekt þá tók hann sér sinn Well, in the earlier, the first time I was found about £2,000 second time about £4,000 um, the third of, kept going up as the years went by, you know rates had the rates of inflation, especially if Iceland wanted a new co a coast guard vessel. Mér fannst alltaf skemmtilegt að vera með Bretum, þeir börðust eins og ljón til að byrja með, en þeir sáu það sko að leikur var tapaður, og það bara viðsjöndi það. Olíur drólans á fishing, otherwise I have to report your action that you may have later be prosecuted for this and lawful act. Það er aðra þjóður, eins og til dæmis Belgar og Það er sérstaklega belgar, þeir voru svo meir að þeir fóru að gráta. Það var það versta sem ég komist í minni sjómisku fyrir að það verið með grátandi skýrsi og reyni hjá sér og hóta honum 2007 og stóru sektum. But I've got to be honest and say, in every court case I was involved in, I never ever knew one of the Icelandic gun coast guard officers to tell a lie. They always stated the facts as there was. I wanted to congratulate them on their navigation and their chart work, but I dance, not I'd be dropping myself in it. But they were very fair in that respect. The Icelanders continued to worry about overfishing. In 1958, fishery limits were discussed at the first Law of the Sea conference in Geneva. Pressure from the small nations to set a 12-mile limit was resisted and no compromise could be found. On the 1st of September, the Icelandic government extended their limit to 12 miles. When the Icelanders moved to 12 miles, that provoked a very strong uh, reaction uh, in the distant water trawling trade. Uh, basically because um, they wished and they realised that this was a threat to, to their livelihood. For Britain, the 12-mile limit was a violation of international law. The Royal Navy was sent to protect the distant water fishing fleet. The British government sent a fleet on a wet hang and beat us here in an awkward and hard in this matter until Loka of three more main outstanding. They had a principle to ride for the British, and the British are very principled fast men. Og Breta sögðu Íslendingar fara ekki að lögum og þeir ógna hagsmunum sem við höfum og höfum lengi haft á útafinu og þar á leiðandi bregðumst við við með þessum hætti. Í öðru lagi var um tilfinningalegar ástæður að ræða sem áttu rætur í því að togara sjómennirnir í Húl og Grimsby áttu ákveðna innstæðu ef svo má segja, þetta áttu nú við framana frekar en frekar en í síðuru síðari deilunum sem laut að frammistöðu þeirra í síðari heimstyrjöldinni og henni hafði ekki verið gleymt og síðan var að þetta um verulega staðbundna hagsmunni að ræða í Húl og Grimsby einn í Fleetwood framana Nú þá var mikið til hugur í varskismennum að reyna að standa þessi sem best og reyna að sína breytunum að það að Heskipur hægt okkur ekki neitt. En það var líka sko með tólmílunar, það voru önnur manngerð við stjórn á breskustíbunum heldur en 50 og 200. Þá voru það eins og Andersson sko og yfirmennir á þeim stíbum. Þeir voru oft með hóttunar að bara, við voru alltaf með byssuna á lofti sko, tók von að þeim og ég bara ef við gerir þetta og bara sökkið þeir. Þannig að þeir fóru með þetta huga að fór hingað, en þeir bara máttu ekki trefa með hérna. En þeir voru alltaf með þetta kjafti í móðbjum það, bara svökka þeir og gerir eitthvað. Commander Erikur Kristofferson of the Icelandic flagship Thor attempted to arrest the troll in Northern Firm, found fishing inside the new 12-mile limit. Þetta á geta skýrt Northern Firm, það var að flælast þarna í lögbrótum og Eiríkur sendi okkur um borði hann til að taka hann bara á venjulegan hátt og við vorum hann um borði í honum núna að vera þar í einhverja smástund, klukkutíma eða svo lýst þegar að freikátan Ístborn kom. 
og þeir sendu stóran jarðbát með fullana mönnum með halvækni og herskipið sagði sínum mönnum að fara með okkur um bold í Þór en Eiríkur bara neita að taka við okkur og svitt í burtu. In these somewhat muddled circumstances, the Coast Guards unexpectedly found themselves guests of the Royal Navy. We were the only guests of the Royal Navy. We were the only guests of the Royal Navy. We were the only guests of the Royal Navy. And we were the only guests of the Royal Navy. Talið þarna af hæstar á þeim að við kætum orðið of stríðsklæðir ef að við fengjum og fengjum og rámið. Nú það var einn nýri þarna um borð. Hann var hásetti. Og hann var dálítið vel hlýðhóður okkur. Vildi að við tækjum skipið og sýndum því í höfn á Íslandi. Og ég segi það ekki að það máli hafi ekki verið rætt. After 11 days being kept aboard HMS Eastbourne, Commander Anderson offered the Coast Guards a boat so they could row ashore to the American NATO base at Keplavík. Og einu vandamálin sem voru eftir það að ameríska herstjórnum var eitthvað óanað með það að að varnarlöð á Keflavíku hlúðulli vissi ekki það því að kom heilt herskip næstum því upp að bryggi í Keflavík á hans verið við salvi. Unsure of the Royal Navy's orders, the ill-equipped Icelandic Coast Guard was reluctant to confront the trawlers. Instead, they kept a log of all the boats found fishing inside the 12-mile limit. We would see the Icelandic gunboat come alongside the trawler and he, he, he would stand with a, a loud hailer and he would say, Skipper, Skipper, and we would all wave to him and get out of it and all this, you see. And then, of course, they would, they would lower a boat with the Icelandic naval officers stood with a, with the oar and a revolver on the hip. They were getting no molt leg. Eh they said grun okkur við ætlum að senda bát yfir um að stoppa í hjá þeim. Að þá voru búnar út í spjót. Og ætla að skutla þessi í gúmibátana ef við kæmum yfir. Og svo voru það voru með heita gufu sem við voru tilbúnir að sprauta okkur. Og þeir höfðu að þannig að þeir gistu bakbólst hlýðin á skipinu þannig við kæmum með netum þannig við komumst með ekki borð þeim megin en trollið var stjórnbólst megin og þá var hann að fara undir vírana og það var gatt verið lífsættur þegar þeir myndu slá upp bröttinni og stella vírarni niður og við gleist menn í sundur þannig að það gatt við fórum aldrei þeim með einum borð í skipinu þannig að það gatt við stór hættuleg þannig að þeir voru vel undir þetta búnir og þeir ætluðu ekki að þeir bóku um borð it was more mischievous, I think. We, we, we took a lot of it in fun. I don't think we, we realised the seriousness of it then. To us, it wasn't a serious matter. Uh, and that was the way we approached it. We would throw potatoes at the gunboats. You know, that, that is the way the fishermen viewed it. It was, uh, it was a bit of fun. In 1961, Britain accepted the now almost universal 12-mile limit. In return, Iceland destroyed their well-kept records, bringing this war of nerves to a close. The four years of the First Cod War had seen a total of 37 Royal Navy ships and 7,000 sailors protecting the fishing fleet from the six Icelandic gunboats and their 100 coast guards. <laughs> 